Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where we have just six rounds to figure out how the first degree could possibly be connected to the last, while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. Today we are spiraling from the Blarney Stone to the Year of the Four Emperors. That's weird. I chose Blarney Stone as my starting degree because it's March and it's almost St. Patrick's Day. And Blarney Stone is in Ireland. (laughs) That's true. I'm really excited that you have chosen the Blarney Stone because the Irish accent is the only one I can even slightly do. Okay. So I hope you're prepared for a bunch of Irish accent during this episode. I hope our Irish listeners are prepared to be offended. And I have no idea what the year of the four emperors could possibly be about besides a bunch of political upheaval. So it sounds like it's going to be a mess. Round one. The Blarney Stone is a block of carboniferous limestone that's built into the battlements of Blarney Castle, which is in Blarney, Ireland. The year of the four emperors was 69 AD. It was a year that Rome had four emperors. <laughs> oh, I was thinking China for some reason. No, Rome, Roman Empire. Okay. Do you see anything that these two degrees have in common? Well, the Blarney Stone is... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. But the Blarney Stone isn't a castle. And I'm sure they had castles for the emperors or some sort of palace. That's pretty I'm going to do the whole episode like this, Rosanna. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That was really good. I was expecting it to be terrible, but it's good. You sound like the <laughs> discount version of the host of the Mens Rea podcast, Sinead, who's actually Irish. <laughs> You're welcome. So, your connection is castles. Yeah. Some sort of um, royal residence. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. I really wish I could know now if our listeners wanted me to continue doing the Irish accent the entire episode. Maybe we'll get some feedback and then we can do another episode later, just all in your Irish accent. There you go. And I will go deep American South. Or I could also do Valley Girl. Oh, yes. Oh, that would be so much fun. Like, I can totally do Valley Girl because I, like, used to live in the Valley and I'm totally a girl, so... Oh, man, that's beautiful. I feel like you really need to pop some gum during that. Oh, my God, totally. So the Blarney Stone is just a block of limestone that was built into the battlements of Blarney Castle in Blarney, which is five miles from Cork, Ireland. Legend says that if you kiss the Blarney Stone, you are endowed with the gift of the gab, great eloquence, or skill of flattery. Do you get to choose which one you get? No, it's just like being good at talking. The stone was set into a tower of the castle in 1446, and that castle is a very popular tourist site. People kiss the stone, and then they also take tours of the castle and the gardens. Because of this tradition of kissing the stone, the word Blarney has come to mean clever, flattering, or a coaxing talk. Because when you kiss it, you get these sort of special talky abilities. Special whaties? Talky talky abilities. Okay, we need to get you to the Blarney Stone stat. (laughs) I have obviously never kissed it. I know good at talky. (laughs) An Irish politician was quoted as saying that Blarney means flattery that is sweetened by humor and wit. Which I think is adorable. That is nice. There are a lot of different stories and legends about the origin of the stone, how it got to the Blarney Castle, how it got its power, and nobody knows for sure what it is. But the tradition to kiss the stone seems to have started around the late 17th century. That's when people started kissing the stone to get these talky abilities. See, that's now going to be a word, too. (laughs) 
Do you know how big this stone is? It's a good size. There's a picture of it in the Wikipedia article. There's actually a picture of somebody kissing it. So now I'm going to tell you how to kiss the stone. No Frenching? No, it's Ireland, not France. God. To kiss the stone, you have to walk up to the castle's peak, but then you have to lean over backwards on the edge. So Mm -hmm. you almost like you, you lean your back over the wall to where when you're upside down, your face is facing the stone, and that's how you kiss it. I feel like somebody told somebody that once as a joke, <laughs> and it became a thing, and then they just told everybody that. There are bars that they put on the wall to hold on to, so you hold them as you are leaning upside down. People also usually bring a helper to hold their legs. Before they installed the wrought iron rails, it was pretty dangerous. Because the participants were held upside down by their ankles. Oh. Yeah. No, thank you. Here's an interesting fact about the Blarney Stone. In the Sherlock Holmes radio dramatization of The Adventure of the Blarney Stone, which was first broadcast in 1946, a man in the story attempted to kiss the Blarney Stone, and he falls to his death. Holmes' investigation reveals that this was actually a murder. (gasps) The man's boots had been greased before the attempt. Pretty sneaky, right? That's very bad. Round two. Okay, Nikki, what do you think the next degree is? So, I got distracted with Ireland, and I... Forgot I was supposed to write something down until the end, so all I wrote down was Sherlock Holmes. Ah. But I actually feel like that could be a good one, because Sherlock Holmes is fascinating. I'm actually surprised we haven't done Sherlock Holmes before. So is your guess Sherlock Holmes? It's gotta be. Your guess of Sherlock Holmes is... Incorrect. Aww. The next degree is flattery. Oh, I never would have gotten that one. Flattery is also called adulation and blandishment, which I'd never heard that term before. Blandishment. Huh. That's a new word to me. Yeah. So flattery is the act of excessive compliments, and it's usually used to ingratiate yourself with another person. Also often used in pickup lines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One example of flattery in a negative light is in the Eighth Circle of Hell in the Divine Comedy, Dante refers to flatterers waiting in human excrement because the words that they were saying were the equivalent of excrement. (laughs) Dante says flattery is talking poop. (laughs) (laughs) Some examples of characters that were insincere flatterers are Wormtongue from The Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. Goneril and Regan from King Lear. And Iago from Othello. Julius Caesar was notorious for his flattery. He used it a lot to get what he wanted. And the Greek essayist Plutarch wrote... How to Tell a Flatterer from a Friend. And he wrote that all the way back in the first century. I don't think human nature has really changed that much over time. That's fair. Interesting fact about flattery. Historically, it's been a standard part of addressing royalty, especially the reigning monarchs. Edmund Spencer flattered Queen Elizabeth in his poem called The Fairy Queen. And William Shakespeare flattered King James I in Macbeth. Round three. All right, Nikki, what do you think the next degree is on our path to the year of the four emperors? I'm so ready for this one. Oh, okay. So at first, you said Dante, and I thought, well, Dante would be really cool. But then you said Julius Caesar, and he is from Rome. Also, I made a typo writing it down, and I wrote Julius Caesar. So now I want some sort of alternate history where Julia Caesar was the emperor. Yes! Because that's what I have in my notes, and so it must be true. You need to manifest it into actualization. 
Yes. I am all in for some sort of version of that. But my guess is Julius Caesar. Your guess of Julius Caesar is <laughs> incorrect. Oh, come on. That was a really good guess. Thank you. We're just too far away from it, you know? I know. I figured it was early, but I'm like, we'll go to, to Julius and then nope. to Brutus and then to mm -hmm. Antony Wrong. and then to Cleopatra. No, we're not going to go through all the different people. Okay, fine. Oh, God, no. Okay. The next degree, w would you like to know what it is or do you want to keep talking about uh, <laughs> Julius Caesar? I would love to know. Okay. Please tell me. The next degree is King Lear. King Lear is a Shakespearean play. So is Julius Caesar. Didn't he write a play about Julius Caesar? I'm pretty sure he did. There's still a chance. So King Lear is a tragedy by William Shakespeare. Came out around 1605. A lot of Shakespeare's works, they can't really pin down to an exact date, but around 1605. And it's actually derived by the legend of Lear of Britain, who was a mythological pre-Roman Celtic king from the History of the Kings of Britain by Joffrey of Monmouth, who we just talked about. Oh, hey. Yeah. Did. So here's the summary of King Lear. King Lear is the king of Britain, and he wants to retire. He decides to divide his kingdom between his three daughters. His daughter, Regan is the wife of Cornwall. His daughter, Goneril, is the wife of Albany. And they both responded to his request for a show of love. But his third daughter, Cordelia, was not able to because she didn't want to be hypocritical. She pretty much just said, I love you as much as I should love you because you're my father. Which is reasonable. It seems like the most reasonable thing you could say. Yeah, but the other two were all about the flattery and we love you more than the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. and Yeah. So in yeah. a fit of rage, because Cordelia was his favorite, King Lear banishes her and she leaves to marry the king of France. As you do. Yeah, as you do. Marry the king of France. Yeah. When <laughs> Lear's advisor, Kent, attempts to tell him that what he's doing is wrong, he gets banished also. Lear begins a series of visits to Gonril and Reagan's houses, and he's followed around by a disguised and loyal Kent. Gonril gets in a fight with her dad, so then he goes to stay with her sister Reagan. Kent is sent ahead, fights with Oswald, and is put in the stocks by Reagan. The sisters then get together with their dad and tell him to just dismiss all of his followers. And he's like, no, he's mad about that. So then he leaves. And when Gloucester returns to the castle, he's accused of being a traitor. And his eyes are like gouged out. <laughs> and then they throw him out into the wilderness. <sighs> so Gonoriel has a crush on Edmund and so does Reagan. Then Cordelia's army finds King Lear and Cordelia and King Lear reconcile. But then they're taken prisoner by Edmund's soldiers and Edmund's orders them both to be killed. After the battle, Gonoriel and Reagan both encounter Edmund, and they both tell them how they feel about him. Awkward. <laughs> then Goneril poisons her sister Regan, and Regan dies. Oh. Then Goneril kills herself, and an order is then sent to cancel King Lear and Cordelia's execution, but it arrives too late to save Cordelia, so Cordelia dies too. Then King Lear is with her when she dies, and that's his third daughter, and they're all dead now, so he dies of a broken heart. Mm -hmm. Albany abdicates, leaving Kent and Edgar to rule the realm, but then Kent announces that he has a journey to go on and leaves. And then Edgar just, like, contemplates life. And that's the end of the play. <laughs> that's a Shakespearean tragedy. Everybody dies, basically. So, in Geoffrey of Monmouth's version, Cordelia actually lives and restores King Lear to the throne and then succeeds him after his death. But Shakespeare was like, oh, no, 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 we're going dark. <laughs> <laughs> the first known performance of King Lear was in 1606. It was published in a quarto in 1608. Then it appeared in William Shakespeare's first folio which had a bunch of his plays, and they were grouped by category. 
The tragedy of King Lear was included in the first folio in 1623, and that was a more theatrical version. So some modern editors combine the two versions, but then other modern editors say that they each have their own unique identity and that they should be kept separated. After the first English restoration, the play was actually given a happy non-tragic ending because people didn't want to see a sad play. (laughs) But since the 19th century, the original version is considered to be one of Shakespeare's best works, and they call it an observation of the nature of human suffering. That's nice. It's not. It's not nice at all. Here's an interesting fact about King Lear. The Irish playwright and activist Bernard Shaw, who, by the way, won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1925, so he knows what he's talking about, Mm. said, no man will ever write a better tragedy than King Lear. Round four. All right, Nikki, we're about halfway. What do you think the next degree is? I had a hard time pulling anything out of that. I know Quarto is a very specific kind of, I think, printing. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I remember it being mentioned in Romeo and Juliet when I was reading about that in a previous episode. Because of that, I'm going to go with Quarto. Okay. Taking a chance. Your guess of Quarto is incorrect. However, was a folio. I tried the Quarto, but I liked where the first folio went better. Oh, it was folio. Dang it. The first folio is a published collection of Shakespeare's plays called Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies. It was published seven years after he died, which was in 1623. Even though it was called Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies, it's commonly referred to as the first folio. And it is considered one of the most influential books ever published. Unsurprisingly. It contains 36 plays and was prepared by Shakespeare's colleagues Heminges and Condell, who emphasized that it was replacing all the previously published versions because the versions that had been published before weren't always published with permission. So oh. these guys said that the other versions were stolen, maimed, and deformed by frauds and imposters. Harsh words. The collection includes all of the generally accepted plays by Shakespeare, except for Pericles, Prince of Tyre, The Two Noble Kinsmen, and the two lost works called Cordenio and Love's Labor's One. Is, oh, so like Love's Labor's Lost, but okay. Yeah. Uh, the first folio is 900 pages. And the description of the plays, like in the sort of table of contents, includes these terms that I'm going to explain. One is foul papers, which that's like a working draft. I'm going to start. Calling everything I write foul papers. These are my foul papers. If it's called a fair copy, that's the transcript of the foul papers that's been transcribed by either the author or a scribe. And that part also includes detailed stage descriptions. And then if it's called a prompt book, uh, it's basically the full script to guide the performance of the play. So that's like at the the end. It's like the final copy that they actually perform the play from. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting fact about the first folio that may or may not blow your mind. In July of 2006, a complete copy of the first folio owned by Dr. Williams Library was auctioned at Sotheby's Auction House. The book, which was in its original 17th century binding, (sighs) sold for, would you like to guess? Oh, just an insane amount of millions and millions of dollars. So it sold for £2,808,000, which is like uh, $3.6 million. Oh, I imagine it would have sold for more. Well, yeah, Sotheby's top estimate was £3.5 million, which is more like $4.5 million U.S. dollars. 
That's way less than I would have expected. Yeah. That copy is one of only about 40 remaining complete copies. And only one other copy of the book remains in private ownership. Round five. Nikki, we have a couple of degrees to go. What do you think this next one is? Heck, I forgot we were going to try to to get to some emperors. (laughs) How are we going to get to those Roman emperors? Can we get there with foul papers? Because that sounded like a lot of fun. Oh my god, right? (laughs) Also, this one, I had a hard time pulling anything out. The next degree is 2.8 million pounds. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rosanna. (laughs) You're so helpful. I know. I do kind of want to go with Sotheby's, though. Because I feel like I can see them auctioning uh, something to do with Roman emperors. Because if anybody would be auctioning something having to throw Roman emperors, it would be Sotheby's. I think that's as close a connection as I'm going to find, so I'm going with Sotheby's. Your guess of Sotheby's is incorrect. Oh. The next degree is lost work. Yeah, those are just regular words, Rosanna. A lost work is a document or literary work produced sometime in the past that has no surviving copies. Ah. I can see how this could connect. It mostly applies to works from the classical world, but occasionally refers to more modern works. The documents can be lost to history by destruction of an original manuscript, and all later copies got destroyed as well. Just every evidence of it is gone. Like so much from the Library of Alexandria that we've discussed before. Yes, exactly. There's a lot from that. Works or fragments of work that survive are usually found by archaeologists during investigations, but they can be accidentally found by anyone. The Nag Hammadi Library Scrolls, which were early Christian and Gnostic texts, were discovered in 1945 by a farmer. He found 13 leather-bound papyrus codices from either the 3rd or 4th century. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Sometimes works can have survived and people don't know because they were used as bookbinding materials or they were erased and written over, but not totally erased. I've heard of a lot of that stuff when they needed more paper, monks would... (laughs) Just write over things. The Archimedes Palimpsest was used to make a prayer book almost 300 years after it was originally written. So the Parchment Codex Palimpsest was originally a 10th century Byzantine Greek copy of an otherwise unknown work of Archimedes of Syracuse and some other authors too. They just wrote prayers over it. So you might ask yourself, If something is a lost work, it's lost, so how do you know about it? Because other texts talk about it. Yes, well-known but not recovered works are known about because they are described or referenced in works that did survive. The Naturalist Historia of Pliny the Elder and De Architectura of Vitruvius are some of those kinds of works. Couldn't find the original, but it was referenced somewhere else. Okay. Sometimes authors destroy their work, or they ask that it be destroyed after they die. But sometimes Mm. the people that say they're going to destroy it after (laughs) they die don't. Mm -hmm. One example is the Roman poet Virgil's Latin poem, Enid. It was actually saved by Augustus, who was the first Roman emperor. He was supposed to get rid of it and just didn't. So that's cool. Which is actually pretty awesome. If he hadn't have saved that, I wouldn't have the tattoo, which is a quote from that, on the back of my neck. Yeah, who knows what kind of crazy quote you would have tattooed to your neck. I know. That's from Virgil's Enid. <laughs> Listeners, I have a tattoo on the back of my neck that says, Adontis Fortuna Iovat, which means basically fortune favors the bold. So you should thank Augustus. So thanks, Augustus. 
<laughs> and as you mentioned earlier, the destruction of ancient libraries like the Library of Alexandria were the cause of so many lost works, so many that we don't even know what we lost. Oh, it hurts my my little mm -hmm. library feels. Yeah. So the subject of lost works shows up in pop culture quite a bit, like in the Da Vinci Code, in the Hemingway hoax, and there was an episode of Doctor Who called the Shakespearean Code. My interesting fact about lost work is that if lost work sounds interesting to you, you should go read the article because it's got a huge list, pages and pages of examples. And they're all separated into categories. The categories are classical world, specific titles, and unnamed works. There's ancient Chinese text, ancient Indian text, lost biblical texts. Second through the 20th centuries, all broken out by century. Lost collections. And there's another category that is rediscovered works. Sounds fascinating. Round six. Nikki, we're already on your last guess for the episode. We are. What do you think it is? I think I have a chance, but I'm I'm scared it's it's too obvious <laughs> that you're gonna you're gonna be sneaky again. So I had written down Gnostic texts and Archimedes and Virgil, and then you said Augustus. We thanked Augustus. Not only is that a baby name I'm considering. <gasps> I love it. Listeners, if you didn't listen to our Q&A episode, uh, I'm expecting a baby boy very soon. But as with our last child, my husband and I are waiting to the last minute to decide on a name because we like to spend the entire pregnancy arguing about why the other one's chosen names are stupid. So much fun. But Augustus, as you said, was an emperor in Rome. And... You're talking about the year of the four emperors, so maybe he was one, so I'm going with Augustus. Also, I really want to get one right, because it's been a really long time. Your guess of Emperor Gus Gus is... <laughs> oh my god. Correct! <gasps> I finally got one! <sighs> Alright, so would you like to hear about Gaius Octavius Thurnius? Yes, so much. Also, Octavius is a super cool name. Or Octavian, I like better. So that is what Augustus's name was when he was born. Gaius Octavius Thurnius. Augustus was a Roman statesman and a military leader, and, as mentioned previously, the first emperor of the Roman Empire. He was emperor from 27 BC to 14 AD. He founded the Roman Principate, which was during the first period of the Roman Empire, and he is known as one of the most effective and controversial leaders in human history. Kind of a big deal. Those are two words you don't usually hear together. Effective and controversial? Usually if they're effective, they're not controversial. <laughs> His maternal granduncle was Julius Caesar. Oh. Julius Caesar named Augustus as his adopted son and heir. And then Augustus worked with Mark Antony and Marcus Lepidus to form the Second Triumvirate. And they defeated the assassins of Caesar. While that was successful, the three guys' ambition was a big clash. It tore them apart. And Lepidus mm -hmm. was driven into exile and Mark Antony committed suicide. Augustus appeared to restore the Free Republic, but he actually ruled as a military dictator. Augustus enlarged the empire dramatically during his rule. He reformed the Roman system of taxation. He developed a network of roads, a courier system, a standing army, police and firefighting services, and he rebuilt a ton of the city. So he got a lot done. I think that's why they called him the most, most effective. Yeah. He died at 75 years old, probably of natural causes, uh, but he also could have been poisoned by his wife, Livia. Oh. Augustus was succeeded by his adopted son, Tiberius, who was also his stepson and his former son-in-law. 
I'd like to see the, how that family tree works so I can understand. And the month of August is named after Augustus. Yeah. I want a month named after me. Nickuary. Nickuary. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my interesting fact. Augustus's reign began a time of relative peace that they called Pax Romana. Rome was pretty chill for more than two centuries, even though there were some wars regarding, like, imperial expansion at the frontiers. Oh, yeah. Then there was a year-long civil war of imperial succession known as the Year of the Four Emperors, which happened... After Augustus's death, obviously. He laid the foundation of a regime that lasted, in one form or another, for nearly 1,500 years, all the way through the ultimate wow. decline of the Western Roman Empire and until the fall of Constantinople in 1453. And that takes us to our final degree, the Year of the Four Emperors. In the year 69 AD, the Roman Emperor had four emperors in one year. That is a lot. It is a lot. They were Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespanian. So starting the year before in 68 AD, there was a lot of unrest and rebellion in Rome regarding the current emperor, who was Emperor Nero, the current emperor's taxes mostly, because people ah. don't like to be taxed too hard, obviously. Or, or Yeah, that's true, or at all. There were plots <laughs> to take him out of power and replace him with someone named... Nymphidius Sabinus. Nero found out that he'd been tried in absentia, so that was rude. Oh. And he was condemned to death as a public enemy, so he just committed suicide. Oh. He was the first Roman emperor to commit suicide, and his death ended the Julio Claudian dynasty. Servius Sulpicius Galba was the governor of Hispania. These names. Whew. The governor of Hispania Terraconesis at that time, and then he was made emperor after Nero died. When Galba became emperor, he appointed Alus Vitellius as governor of Germania Inferior. During Galba's travel to Rome, he destroyed towns and imposed ridiculous fines on the Romans, and the Romans were like, No, we don't like you. You're being a jerk. <laughs> He also canceled all of the reforms that Nero had passed, and he executed a bunch of senators without trial, and he refused to pay soldiers, <laughs> and everybody was real ticked off. <laughs> I could see why there were two more emperors that year. No, three more. <laughs> this, is, this is the first one out Oh, of he's still the first one. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. The Germania Inferior refused to swear allegiance to Galba. And they decided that they liked Governor Vitellius better, so they just called him their emperor. <laughs> uh, when Galba heard that that happened, he totally freaked out <laughs> and named Lucius Calpurnius Piso Licinianus his successor, which seriously offended Marcus Salvius Otho who was a nobleman that thought he should be the successor. <laughs> so Otho bribed the Praetorian guard, who were the soldiers that Galba wasn't paying. He bribed them to get their support. <laughs> and then he got them to go kill Galba. And then <sighs> Otho was named successor. That was easy. That day, the Senate recognized o Otho as the emperor with much relief, <laughs> they were ready to move on to somebody else, too. <laughs> but yeah. Otho was greedy. So they're like, eh. <sighs> but he didn't have the reputation of tyranny or cruelty. So they're like, all right, fine, we'll take him if he's greedy. His biggest issue was Vitellius's support in Germania, because the people there were still like, go Vitellius! <sighs> So, uh -huh. Otho offered to marry Vitalius's daughter to, like, you know, join forces. But by that point, it was mm -hmm. too late for negotiations. So, the armies met, and Vitalius's crew defeated Otho. Instead of just running away, Otho committed suicide as well. Goodness. 
Yeah, he was emperor for three months. So that was the second out of the four. So the Senate hears about the suicide, and they're like, okay, cool, let's do this again for the third time this year. So they recognize <laughs> Vitellius as emperor, and so then he headed to Rome. The people of the city of Rome, though, unlike those in Germania, were not fans of Vitellius. Things didn't go well from here either. Vitellius had a bunch of banquets and parades, and he spent almost all the money in the imperial treasury. He, like, went into debt right away. <laughs> the debt collectors started demanding repayment, so he just ordered them tortured and executed. Then he just murdered wow. a bunch of citizens and people that he considered possible rivals. My gosh. During this time, the people living in Egypt and the Middle East provinces of Judea and Syria were calling Vespasian, who was this fourth guy, they were calling him their emperor. And he had a ton of support from that area. So he traveled to Alexandria, where they called him emperor too. Because <laughs> they just liked him better. And he ended up gaining control of the grain supplies from Egypt. Oh. And while he was working on that part, his son Titus stayed in Judea to deal with uh, a Jewish rebellion that was happening. So then Vespasian gained even more support from several other provinces. And then he invaded Italy and completely destroyed Vitellius's army. Vitellius tried to get the city back on his side with bribes and promises of power. And he sent an emissary to try for peace talks. But, like, nobody liked him, so they didn't even try. Yeah, who would trust him after everything he did? He, everybody just murdered everybody. Vespasian's men caught Vitellius and killed him as he was trying to run away. They also burned down the Temple of Jupiter while they were there, which I guess was a huge deal, oh. too. So then the Senate is like, oh, my God, we have to do this again. So the Senate gets together, acknowledges <laughs> Vespasian as emperor the next day. And that was in December of 69 AD. So he was the fourth one, finally. <laughs> Vespasian founded the stable Flavian dynasty, and he died of natural causes. And he was succeeded by his son Titus, the one that he had sent to work on the Jewish rebellion. This interesting fact is probably, I don't even know if you're going to believe me, because the year of four emperors is pretty <laughs> wild, right? Yeah. The year 193 AD was called the year of five emperors. Oh my goodness. The year 238 AD was the year of six emperors. <laughs> <sighs> and we have finally made it through all six degrees. We went from, do you remember do you remember where we started? <laughs> no. Blarney Stone. <laughs> That's right. Oh, the Blarney Stone. We went from Blarney Stone to Flattery to King Clear to First Folio to Last Work to Augustus to Year of the Four Emperors. That wasn't too bad. All right. So, Nikki, what did you think of the spiral? <laughs> the spiral's really fun. But a bit messy. I enjoyed showing the accent. I enjoyed the emperors. I did not enjoy getting tricked with Julius Caesar. And I know you said him with a silly grin on your face, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, You're absolutely. Like, oh, I think he's going to put this down. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't pass it up. It was just right there. I couldn't myself. But you did get another point on the scoreboard for the season. I did, and I'm very happy about that. And now it's time for Whim of the Week. Our Whim this week is a TV show recommendation from both of us, because it's about a show we are both very much enjoying. Mm -hmm. So the show is currently available on Hulu. It's called Good Girls, and it stars... Christina Hendricks, who you may know from Mad Men. Love her. Mae Whitman, you may know from some movies in Parenthood. Yep. And Retta. Donna! Who was 
Donna on Parks and Rec, and she is awesome. Treat yourself. <laughs> I love all of these actresses, and you'll also recognize plenty of other people in the show, too. The, so the show premise is that you have these women. They all have children. They all need money for different reasons. And so... Good reasons. They end up getting into... Yeah, very good reasons. They end up getting into a life of crime. And it often feels like it's on the verge of becoming the show Weeds, but it never falls into that trap of just... The woman is getting way too involved in, like, romantic elements of of stuff that she shouldn't. Yeah, it's much funnier, and the characters are so likable. Yes. And it's surprising. It doesn't always go where you think it's going to go, which I really like. Yeah. Also, the big bad guy is very attractive. <laughs> and it's hard to look away when he's on the screen. He's got that swagger. He really does. The second season comes out. It's already out, listeners. Here's the thing. Uh, We record this a a little ahead of time, and so it's not out for us. But by the time you hear this episode, the first episode will have premiered. It starts Sunday, March 3rd. If you want to start watching it on regular TV with season two, it's on NBC. But if you want to go back and watch the first season, go to Hulu. Because we are in the past and you were in the future. We are jealous of you right now that you may have already so seen jealous. the first episode. It's so good. It's so funny. It is really good. It's great. I love it. I love it, too. It took me um, about half of the first episode to get into it. But after that, I was hooked. So listeners, check out the show Good Girls. Five stars from... Six Degrees of Wiki. We love it. Go watch it. (laughs) And let us know if you do watch it and what you think of it, too. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. Keep up with us at SixDegreesOfWiki.com and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to let us know what you think. Looking for early access to episodes and bonus content like bloopers? Go to Patreon.com to become a Six Degrees of Wiki patron and get discounts on merch, or even help us choose degrees. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.